Thank you, Sandy, and I'd like to uh, thank all of you uh, for being here and for being uh, friends of the Gladstone Institute. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm uh, relatively new to San Francisco and to the Gladstone. I moved here uh, two years ago uh, to join the Gladstone Institutes as a uh, scientist on faculty here uh, studying heart disease, and I'm also a practicing uh, cardiologist that takes care of adults with uh, heart conditions here in San Francisco. And so I'm going to tell you today about uh, some work that we're doing uh, for a condition called heart failure uh, that many of you uh, may know. So who here has heard of heart failure or know somebody uh, with heart failure? So not surprising, I see uh, a lot of hands here. So before we talk about the disease, I think I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how amazing uh, all of our hearts are. And I know it, it sounds kind of obvious, but I think it's important to just reflect on this. So your, your, the job of your heart is to pump blood to every single cell and organ in your body. So if the heart can't do its job, every single part of your body uh, suffers and deteriorates. So it's, it's absolutely central. And so the heart is about the size of your fist, as, uh, as you all know, and it's made up of billions of little heart muscle cells that are collectively all work together to, to pump blood. And when the heart doesn't pump blood well, bad things happen, as I told you. All your organs don't work. The liver doesn't work. The kidneys doesn't work. The brain doesn't work that well. And it's a miserable existence. People feel lousy. They can't do things that they should be able to do, like walk up a flight of stairs, you know, walk in the grocery store, do some, some little bit of exercise. They have trouble sleeping at night. They fill up with fluid in their lungs and their legs, and people feel like they're drowning. And uh, it doesn't get better, it just progresses and progresses. And to make an analogy here, imagine, it's a little bit of a loose analogy, but I think it's appropriate. Imagine that your heart is like uh, an engine to a car, and we're all born with, say, a uh, eight-cylinder engine, um, <clears throat> if you have a normal heart. And the heart <clears throat> does its job, but over time, things can injure the heart. So if you have a heart attack and part of those heart muscle cells die, or you have problems with your heart valves and, and the heart gets overloaded, or you have high blood pressure for too long and the heart has to work too hard for years and years and years, what happens is that slowly uh, you go from an eight-cylinder motor to a six-cylinder motor. And some people have a two-cylinder or one-cylinder motor if they lose enough of their heart muscle cells. And that's a really bad thing because a car, if it's malfunctioning, you can keep it in the garage, but your heart has to keep going, right? It, it has no choice. And so imagine your heart has to keep beating every single day of your life on two cylinders. So it, it's this vicious cycle, and the heart just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So we've done really good with a lot of things in cardiovascular disease over the last 40 years. Uh, as a field, we've done really well with heart attacks, uh, we've done uh, well with, uh, we can op you know, open up heart arteries with stents and do bypass surgery. We've done well with lowering people's blood pressure and cholesterol, thanks to the work of uh, Dr. Maley here and, and many others. Uh, but we haven't done so well with fixing the actual motor when it starts malfunctioning, this vicious cycle uh, of heart failure. And so that's what I'm going to uh, talk to you today. Uh, about new ways and maybe a surprising way that we found that uh, is able to treat heart failure. So what's the current state of affairs? So heart failure is common and it's lethal. So do any of you guys any, have any idea how many people in the United States have heart failure? Any guesses? It's, it's very high, but it's six million people in the United States and it's growing. So to put that number in perspective, that is larger than most major metropolitan regions in the United States. The, the Bay Area is estimated to have seven to eight million people uh, in total. So this is a large number, and it's lethal. So if you get diagnosed with heart failure today, in the next five years, your chance of being alive at year five is a coin flip, 50%. And so <clears throat> despite current medical therapy in 2017, those are the numbers. And that's worse than some of our most common cancers, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. So we really have to do better uh, for our patients and our, uh, our loved ones. And so what do we use in this day and age? So many of you may be familiar with these drugs or heard some of these drugs. Uh, we use drugs that basically block fright or flight stress hormones like adrenaline uh, to kind of keep the heart from being bombarded with these adrenaline-like 
hormones. Because that's what happens when the heart starts working on two cylinders. The body overreacts and pours out adrenaline, and that creates this vicious cycle of damaging the heart. So we use things like beta blockers, some of you may have heard of, or ACE inhibitors like lisinopril. And those have done okay, but remember, people are still dying 50% at five years, so we have to do better. So all of these drugs work uh, by blocking these adrenaline hormones at the surface of heart muscle cells. So we reasoned that could we actually work with drugs that go deep inside the cell and get into the nucleus of the heart muscle cell, the so-called command center of the cell, to somehow change the software or the programming of the cell to kind of make the heart muscle cell better. Right? And so we took a surprising approach here. Um, and this is kind of uh, when you keep your antennas up to different areas of science and you hang out with other scientists, uh, you start to pollinate uh, your own ideas and things kind of catalyze. So when I was a training in cardiology uh, in Boston, I uh, was good friends with a scientist named Jay Bradner um, uh, that many of you guys uh, know. And he is an oncologist and was very interested in finding ways to treat leukemia. And uh, what happened is he uh, was telling me and eventually published a paper that showed a prototype drug. Uh, it's called JQ1. Um, you don't need to know the name, but it's actually named after uh, uh, one of his students, uh, Jun Chi, that, that, that synthesized the compound. And uh, the way this compound works is, <laughs> to make a long story short, it actually goes into the command center or the nucleus of a leukemia cell, right, and tricks it. So Jay asked the question, well, how does a leukemia cell, that cancer cell, remember how to be cancer? you know, every time it, it divides. And it turns out that there's <clears throat> machinery within the nucleus of the cell that tells the cancer cell how to be a cancer cell, to keep growing and dividing and taking over the body. And he created this compound to literally make a leukemia cell, this cancer cell, forget how to be cancer. And uh, this compound is now in a number of clinical trials uh, for a number of cancers, including uh, leukemia. So we'd heard about this and um, I, Ask myself the question, kind of a light bulb went off, is that, well, if you can make a cancer cell forget how to be cancer, can you make a stressed out heart cell uh, uh, that's malfunctioning, can you kind of make it forget how to be sick in a way, right? And, and so that was the initial seed idea. So I, I remember that I called up Jay Bradner and uh, uh, I, I asked him, you gotta send over some of this compound, we have to try it. And uh, I, I still remember when we did this experiment, so we, uh, I had a medical student uh, in my laboratory as a summer medical student. I was like, you should, you should try this. So what we did is we took this compound, JQ1, and we put it on heart muscle cells grown in a dish uh, that we made to be stressed out like they, they were in heart failure and sick. And uh, we looked at the cells after we'd given the JQ1, and, and we saw that actually the heart cells looked much better uh, after as early as 24 hours. And so that's great. That's uh, heart failure in a dish. Uh, and so um, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's, it's great. But we want to know, does it really affect heart failure in a, in a living <clears throat> creature with, with heart failure? And so the next step, as you know, is that uh, we use uh, animal models. So there's animals, uh, and we use a lot of, of, of mouse models that have heart failure. Uh, and so we did a clinical trial in mice with heart failure, and we gave one group uh, a placebo, and one group, uh, the JQ1, over the course of one or two months. And we didn't know which group got which. It was a random study, and the, the trainees in my lab didn't know which animals got which when we were looking at them. And just like we do for patients, we can do ultrasounds in these little mice and look at the hearts and see how they're pumping. And I still remember uh, uh, the day. We didn't know which group was which, but uh, my graduate student told me, I sat, you know, I think we've been doing this for about a month. He's like, there's one group of these mice when we're doing the ultrasounds that their hearts actually are pumping really good and the other group is getting really bad. And so we got really, really excited. And when we fin finished the experiment and we kind of unblinded the result, we'd realized that the JQ1 compound had been uh, really healing or preventing these hearts uh, uh, from failing. It was really striking. It's one of those exciting moments in science uh, when you know you're onto something uh, uh, kind of big. And so um, we've been really interested in knowing how this works uh, in, in, in heart muscle cells. And uh, we're still trying to figure this out, but I think the way we're thinking is this. So if you think about how, how cancer works, to make an analogy, cancer is kind of like a, uh, the cells in cancer are like a rogue street gang. Um, they're, you know, they, they, they do their own thing, and uh, anytime 
conditions get a little rough or times get rough, uh, you give them a drug, you try to kill the cancer cells. Um, you could kill one gang leader, but there's always another gang leader that, uh, uh, that comes up no matter how hard you try. And, and that's the real challenge uh, with cancer. There's always that one gang leader that will try to come up and, and get resistant to what your therapies are. But the heart is different. You know, the, heart are, the heart muscle cells are kind of good worker bees. Uh, in the sense that, that you know, they don't try to take over the body and, and grow. There's no, there's no gang leader per se, but th they all try to pump together. But the difference is, is that your heart is not an organ when you're an adult that grows, right, <clears throat> necessarily, uh, tremendously. So what the heart does is it does the only thing it knows how to do. So our heart is really evolved to do one thing really well, is to heal itself and wound with wounds when it's injured. So you know, we're not meant to have big heart attacks or high blood pressure for 20 or 30 years, right? Uh, but what the heart is good at doing is if you got stabbed by a saber-toothed tiger uh, 50,000 years ago trying to heal the wound with, with scar tissue so you don't bleed to death, right? And that's kind of what the heart does when you injure it with high blood pressure or heart attack. It heals the wound uh, and it tries to keep functioning. But the, the problem is, is these kind of wound healing responses that, that the heart have, if they're left to go on for too long, uh, a period of time are too high, if they're too revved up, they ultimately fuel the fire of damaging uh, the organ. And that's really how these uh, uh, drugs like JQ1 work, is they turn down uh, the dial uh, on uh, these wound healing uh, type responses. Uh, and, I, and that really helps the heart uh, heal over time. So where are we going in this? We're trying to understand how uh, these drugs uh, work in the heart. And we're uh, looking for partnerships uh, uh, with pharma companies uh, and other ins institutions to try to partner with us to try to develop this uh, and eventually try to go uh, uh, first in human uh, for patients uh, with heart failure. And um, the other thing I'd like to uh, highlight for you is that, you know, if any of you guys um, have been listening to what's going on in cancer drug discovery, one of the big problems with uh, cancer therapies, all the new cancer therapies that come out, is that a lot of them are good at killing the cancer, but a lot of them are, are quite toxic to the heart. Um, and uh, it's become a big problem. So we're actually in a privileged space. We actually are dealing with uh, prototype drugs and actually <clears throat> drugs that are in uh, clinical trials for cancer that are both anti-cancer, but actually can protect the heart, which is a really uh, nice space uh, to be in. And, I'll leave you with uh, the notion that this is not just a JQ1 thing, as we've discovered in the lab. So we're looking for other players that might be drug targets uh, in the heart. And I feel that we're at the tip of the iceberg uh, in uh, deciphering this. And for every JQ1, there may be a, a whole host of other drug targets that live in the nucleus or command center and cell that might work this way. So this may open up a whole different approach uh, for heart failure. So thank you for listening.